There are so many things that you need in your daily life. But what is the one thing that can help you have them all? Money. If you have money, you can buy anything being sold in the market. From a toothbrush to a luxury car, a house, insurance or a vacation, money can help you buy all kinds of goods and services. However, thousands of years ago, there was no concept of money. Then, how did people buy and sell goods? In those times, people simply exchanged one commodity for another, depending on their requirement. This was called the barter system. However, exchanging goods in the barter system was not so simple. Let us take the example of this fishmonger who wants to exchange fish for some rice. The man who has rice wants to exchange it only with a pair of shoes. And the man who has a pair of shoes to exchange wants a new hammer in return for it. Thus we see that although every person has something to offer, they cannot exchange things as their requirements do not match. An exchange is possible only if every person has exactly what the other person wants in return. Such a situation is called double coincidence of wants. Let us see how the situation changes if money is introduced. When money is introduced, a person can sell his goods to anyone in return for money and use that money to buy what they want from anyone who is selling it. Thus, money eliminates the need for double coincidence of wants. Also, since money enables the exchange process, it is also called a medium of exchange. Money did not always look as we see it today. Here are some early forms of money. These were all things of daily use that had some value of their own. Here is the modern form of money as currency notes and coins. Modern currency uses paper notes and coins made of relatively inexpensive metals. Thus, modern currency has no value of its own. Modern currency has a value only because it is authorized by the government of a country. Did you know the current series of currency notes in India called the Mahatma Gandhi series was started in 1996. Each currency note has its amount written on it in 17 Indian languages. In India, the Reserve Bank of India is the only legal authority that can issue currency notes and coins on behalf of the central government. The rupee is India's currency and nobody can refuse to accept a payment made in rupees in India. Meet Arjun. He is employed in a company. Today is the first of the month and Arjun has received his salary. Arjun only needs a part of his salary right now and he is worried about the safety of his extra cash. So, Arjun is going to deposit his extra cash in the bank. Arjun has a bank account with ABX Bank. Thus, he can deposit his money there. The bank accepts the money and adds it to the deposit in Arjun's bank account. The bank not only keeps Arjun's money safe as a deposit, but also pays interest on the deposited amount. Whenever Arjun needs money, he can withdraw it from his bank deposit on demand. Thus, bank deposits are also called demand deposits. Arjun is in the market and he wants to buy a new TV. But, he is not carrying enough cash with him. No problem. The shop allows him to pay without cash. 
he can make the payment by check. A check is a written instruction to a bank by an account holder to pay a specific sum to a specific person from his deposit. A check has all the information about the person to whom the payment is to be made, the amount A check bears the account number of the person issuing the check. A check also bears a unique check number that can be used to track the payment. In today's economy, a check also represents money, just like cash, and can be used to make payments directly from a bank deposit. People's deposits in a bank create a big cash pool with the bank. As per the directives of the Reserve Bank of India, banks hold about 15% of their deposits as cash to arrange for daily withdrawals by depositors. Did you know? The percentage of cash reserves against deposits that a bank must maintain at all times is called the cash reserve ratio or CRR. This ratio keeps changing from time to time, depending on the prevailing economic conditions. A major portion of the remaining deposits is used by banks to give loans to people for different requirements. Why do banks give loans? The depositors of a bank are allowed to withdraw their deposits on demand and are paid interest on these deposits. On the other hand, the borrowers who take loans repay it to the bank along with interest thereon. The interest charged on loans is more than the interest paid by the banks on deposits. The difference between the interest charged on loans and the interest paid on deposits is the bank's income or profit. The loan given by a bank is also referred to as credit. A loan or credit is subject to certain conditions that the borrower must agree to. These conditions are called terms of credit. The borrower has to pay interest to the lender at a specified rate on the amount taken on credit. A lender often asks for a security against a loan to recover the money in case the borrower fails to repay it. This security is called collateral. The assets that are commonly accepted as collateral against loans are land or property, vehicles, livestock, standing crops and bank deposits. The lender reserves the right to sell the collateral in case of non-repayment to recover the loan amount. A borrower often needs to submit certain documents like proofs of identity, residence, employment and income as specified by the lender to avail a loan. A loan is usually given for a specific duration of time and needs to be completely repaid by a specified date. The borrower repays the loan in cash, by check or by card in installments or as a one-time repayment as specified in the mode of repayment. Many people need extra money for different reasons. But does credit benefit everyone who takes a loan? Consider these two people. They both want to take a loan to start a small business. The man who started the dairy took advantage of the rising demand for milk and made a good profit. He repaid his loan in time. The man who started the poultry farm suffered a big loss in business due to the spread of bird flu and is struggling 
to repay his loan. Thus, credit can bring about a positive or a negative change in a person's life. If you need money on credit, where would you get it from? You could either go to a bank or a cooperative society or approach your relatives and friends. You could also go to professional money lenders and traders or to a landlord if you are in a village. The chart here shows the different sources of credit for rural households in India in 2003. Banks and cooperative societies constitute the formal sector of credit. Landlords, money lenders, traders, relatives, friends and other sources of credit constitute the informal sector of credit. Thus, we see that the formal sector provides only marginally more credit than the informal sector. Let us compare the formal and informal sectors of credit. The credit activities of the formal sector are supervised by the Reserve Bank of India. In comparison, there is no supervisory body for the informal sector of credit. The Reserve Bank of India ensures that banks give loans to rich traders and businessmen as well as farmers, students and small entrepreneurs. However, the credit activities of the informal sector are only driven by profit. In the absence of any control or supervision, the informal sector charges a much higher interest rate than the formal sector. A high rate of interest means that a borrower spends more money to repay the loan and is left with less money for himself. A high rate of interest may result in the loan repayment amount becoming more than the borrower's income. This leads to a debt trap where the person's debt goes on increasing. The chart here shows the credit taken by different kinds of urban households in 2003. Observe that while the rich households get 90% of their credit from the formal sector, the poor households get only 15% of their credit from the formal sector. Thus, the rich have more access to cheaper credit from the formal sector, while the poor still have to depend on loans at higher rates of interest from the informal sector. Cheaper credit is essential for development in a country. Since the formal sector offers more affordable credit, it must increase its lending to more and more people, especially in rural areas. We have seen that poor households in India largely depend on the informal sector for their credit requirements. This is because banks are either not present in a rural area or demand collateral against a loan that the poor people are unable to provide. Thus, the poor are forced to take credit from money lenders who charge high rates of interest and exploit the borrowers. One solution to this problem is organizing people into self-help groups. In a typical self-help group, 15 to 20 members from a neighborhood save regularly to create a savings pool. Members of the group can take small loans from their combined savings and repay the loans with interest that is less than what the money lenders charge. After saving regularly for a few years, a self-help group becomes eligible for a loan from a bank without providing any collateral. The money from the bank loan is used to generate more income and employment opportunities for the members of the group. The members of a self-help group make all the decisions jointly and are jointly responsible for the repayment of loans. Banks also extend loans to poor women organized in self-help groups. Getting organized in self-help groups makes women self-reliant 
and financially independent and gives them an opportunity to discuss social and health issues. Thus, self-help groups allow poor people access to affordable, easy credit and prevent their exploitation by the informal credit sector. The Grameen Bank of Bangladesh is a brilliant example of meeting the credit needs of the poor at affordable rates. The Grameen Bank was founded in 1970 as a small personal project by Professor Muhammad Yunus. The bank now has 6 million borrowers, a majority of them women, in 40,000 villages.